Good afternoon to those of you who didn't hear me a minute ago. I'm Nat Goodspeed. I'm the husband of one, father of three, grandfather of two, and developer for Linden Lab, makers of fine virtual worlds since 1999. I've been working with C++ for many years now. You can tell by the gray hairs. I like playing music, writing code, and silly jokes. <laughs> Today, I've got one word for you folks. Just one word. Coroutines. When a colleague first, can I take questions at the end? Because No, I was just going to say that if you hit the volume button on that remote, it'll make that zoom. Oh, yeah. Ah. Volume up. Or not. <laughs> Move over toward the center of the stage a bit, and then. There you there go. go. There we go. Oh, oh. 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 <laughs> no, no, it'll, it'll go away. Just a uh -oh. oh. Okay. <laughs> when a colleague first tried to explain the term coroutine to me, I ended up with a vague impression of deeply confusing control flow entwined like mating octopi. At the time, my question was, why on earth would you even want to do that? Simon Tatham, author of the Indispensable Putty Package for Windows, presents what you might call a classic example of motivating coroutines. On the left, we have a bit of decompression logic for a simple compression scheme, flag by length count, and repeat, and the character to repeat. So you pick up the character, stop at EOF, if it's the flag byte, you get the repeat count and the character to repeat. For that many times, you emit the character. If it's not the flag, just emit the character and loop back. On the right, we have a simple tokenizer. Yes, there is a bug. I didn't write this. You pick up a character, you stop at EOF. As long as that's an alpha character, you accumulate it into a token. When it stops being an alpha character, you say, I have a word. And then you drop out and say, and the punctuation character that stopped is a punctuation for the token. Each is extremely straightforward, readable despite the appalling lack of comments. What if we want to do both? What if we want to tokenize an input stream that's compressed with that simple compression scheme? Wouldn't it be great if we could somehow stream these two bits of code together? Long about now, all the Unix geeks are nodding and going, pipes, filters. So, we want to be able to hook up the emit call somehow to the get char call on the tokenizer. Of course, we don't want to have to care which emit call or which get char. It's just the next emit feeds a character to the next get char. It's true that in a Unix program, you could create a pipe and fork your process. The unspecified emit function on the left could write a character to that pipe. The get char could, as usual, read from the other end of the pipe. Would that all our problems were so easily solved. That approach has a few problems. Fork isn't really portable to an OS a few of us care about. Introducing a whole new process is a bit heavyweight. And while that neatly addresses this use case, it doesn't really apply to an important use case I'll bring up a bit later. One bit of advice I received early on, whenever possible, for stateful processing, use the machine's instruction pointer to express state rather than bool flags or other variables. Each of the simple routines I just showed is pretty self-evident. You can even spot the bug in the tokenizer without too much analysis. As Tatham points out, you can try to rewrite the logic in either of those routines so that every time you call it again, it consults some sort of state flag to figure out where it last left and jump back there. You can make it work, but the resulting code will be far more complex and hard to read. The details of the algorithm will be swamped by the details of the control flow. I assert that you would not spot the tokenizer bug on inspection. When one coroutine communicates with another, you actually perform a context switch. You're running on a whole different stack that's how something that passes data to a function on one coroutine 
can return that bit of data from a function in another coroutine. So you've got the tokenizer, it's waiting on a get care. The decompressor is doing its thing and blanking the screen. Decompressor <laughs> is doing its thing. Presently, it calls emit, which performs a context switch to the waiting get care. Get care returns the character to the tokenizer, which returns from get care, and does its own processing. After a while, it calls get care again, which context switches back to the decompressor. The decompressor wakes up in the emit call, returns from the emit call, and continues processing. Donald New describes coroutines in the art of computer programming. This is not an upstart new technology. The heaviest concurrency tactic is a whole new process. For instance, by calling fork. For our purposes, it really doesn't matter whether you also call exec. Nor does it matter whether the other process is on a separate machine. We're talking about models of concurrency, not about how the distinct bits of code communicate. Each process has its own data space, its own stack, and its own CPU. Of course, what I mean by real or virtual CPU is time slicing. That's irrelevant for purposes. Within each process, you can run some number of threads. Each threads are lighter weight in that they all share the parent process's data space. In fact, the original Unix term for thread still visible in GDB is lightweight process, or LWP. Each still has its own stack and its own CPU. Within each thread, you can run some number of coroutines. Each coroutine also has its own stack. The big difference is that coroutines within the same thread explicitly pass control back and forth. They do not literally run concurrently much more on this later. I would be remiss if I failed to mention a common tactic used to simulate coroutine processing in C and C++. Simon Tatham, on the page I cited earlier, presents a set of preprocessor macros encapsulating some very strange abuse of the venerable switch statement. <coughs> he asserts that Tom Duff of Duff's device fame invented this hack, and Duff confirms it in a blog post. And yes, these slides will be available later. You don't have to frantically type the URLs now. Amusingly, Duff himself says, I never thought it was an adequate general purpose coroutine implementation because it's not easy to have multiple simultaneous activations of a coroutine. And it's not possible using this technique to give up control anywhere but in their top level routine. To this, I would add, it's a bigger problem than you might first realize that you cannot save any data in local variables. Despite the syntactic resemblance to a coroutine, you are in fact restarting at the official entry point of the function on every call. Nonetheless, the tactic survives. It even shows up in one of the boost ASIO examples. So if we're talking about wanting to run different chunks of code within the same process, each on its own stack, why is it even interesting to introduce the coroutine concept? Why not just run each of these on its own thread? Well, of course, as you're well aware, you have this thread running along here. It wants to make a data access. That's fine. You have this other thread, which is also making it running along. It makes a data access. Also fine. In fact, everybody's happy until they both want to access the same data at the same moment. Of course, you can put locking around that data access. But let's return to the, the decompressor tokenizer example. We don't actually need or want both these functions to run continuously. When the tokenizer calls get care, it's entirely appropriate for it to wait while the decompressor fetches the next character. When the decompressor calls emit, it's fine for it to suspend there until the tokenizer needs another character. This is a different paradigm than running distinct threads. It's simpler and it's cheaper. Of course, you can emulate this behavior with threads. In the code that connects emit with get care, 
you could put a synchronization primitive to ensure that only one of these threads is running at the same time. Or, as with Unix filters and pipes, you could construct a bounded queue. But you end up in the same place anyway. When the queue is empty, the tokenizer's get care necessarily waits for the decompressor's next emit call. When the queue is full, the decompressor's emit call has to wait for the tokenizer's next get care. In effect, coroutine behavior is like connecting them with a bounded queue of size zero. <coughs> As software developers, we have a large number of tools at our disposal. The whole trick, the art of computer programming, as it were, is to use the right tool for the problem at hand. As software developers, sometimes we have the luxury of creating a brand new edifice from the ground up, beautiful, elegant, that is until some pointy haired person directs Wally to add a feature. Other times, we find ourselves working with a very large volume of legacy code written by a number of very bright people in a tearing hurry. That's never happened to anyone here. <laughs> Finding your hasty throwaway proof of concept has somehow morphed into your flagship product that must keep running. An interactive GUI program driven by more or less arbitrary mouse and keyboard events is necessarily built around a main dispatch loop. A program that displays animated graphics is built around a frame rendering loop. It's not surprising that a program that does both unifies those loops. But now you're working with a program that cannot block for anything. If you make a request to some back-end server and actually wait for the result, your users start screaming about <coughs> lag. The frame rate plummets. The mouse becomes unresponsive. As your program grows, as Wally continues adding features, you find your code managing lots of resources. Inconveniently, these resources must be available to many different bits of code. The items that you're rendering must also be enumerated in a list box. A drop-down menu must be able to select one of them, and so forth. I know, let's make them all globals. <laughs> Dubious idea. All this happened long, long ago, far, far away, long before you arrived on the scene. Now you have to live with it. So to recap, your program must not block for anything. It must fetch lots of data from your backend servers. In fact, it must perform long, complex sequences of high latency requests. So what do we do? break out our sequence of server requests onto a separate thread, right? <coughs> this is where globals really bite you in the butt. When you're designing a multi-threaded program from the ground up, you can ensure that every new access to a shared resource is properly synchronized between threads. But when you're working with a large existing program that freely uses globals, I know of no way to prove that running old code on a new thread can't destructively interfere with existing data. I'm going to say that again. I know of no way to prove <coughs> that running old code on a new thread cannot destructively interfere with existing data. Any one global access is straightforward to manage, but scatter enough of them through your code and it effectively immobilizes you. So we wind up with a variety of tactics to manage asynchronous requests without using threads. Did I mention that a number of different people built this code? It's straightforward to set up a low-level async request. At some point, you send a request and return without waiting. You can arrange to pull the low-level network I.O. code once per frame to see if you have an incoming re reply. The real question is, when you receive a reply, what then? One approach is to update a state flag, an int or an enum, and then perform a giant switch statement on that variable. 
I call this the big switch. But of course, a long chain of ah, if else is completely equivalent. I actually have a handout here, which I completely forgot to hand out. But I'm going to be talking about some code, which you can look at after the fact. I have no idea how many people here are not good at that. There are 30 copies. See what you can do. <laughs> <laughs> when I say giant switch statement, I'm speaking literally. There are 1,800 lines of state-dependent code in this function. You'll forgive my not printing the entire function body on the handout. <coughs> that illustrates one of the drawbacks of this tactic. You can't structure your logic as a hierarchy of layered functions the way you ordinarily might. Of course, any given state can call functions, as long as the called function does not itself need to suspend processing. Any logic which might need to wait for results must be at the top level. As the program evolves, the function body grows without bound. Another very significant drawback is that local variables are not preserved. Any data that must persist between states must be stored somewhere else. Let's look at another problem in big switch land. This actually happened to us. Look at the red line on this slide, line 16 on your handout. It was with some dismay that we realized that the underlying DNS call was actually blocking this program, which must not block for anything, was blocking on a DNS call. What now? You can presume the availability of a corresponding non-blocking call, but for starters, you certainly have to introduce another state. It's actually worse than that. Notice that the blocking call is inside a loop. So we have to unroll the loop to yet another state. <coughs> We have to make the loop control variable <coughs> static. Whoops. It's an iterator into a stack vector. Have to make that static too. Are you starting to feel the pain yet? <laughs> Would it surprise anyone to find ugly kludges in the code base to try to avoid this kind of surgery? It also gives you some insight into why we end up with empty states to avoid the risk and complexity of actually getting rid of some particular state. <coughs> In fairness to Tom Duff, Christopher Koloff, Simon Taffin, and others, the big switch statement function in our code probably would be improved by preprocessor magic to invent new state variables, state variable values, and root control into the middle of nested control structures. That would solve one of its problems. The other two would, of course, remain the unbounded growth and vanishing local variables. It would be all too easy to inadvertently code a stack loop control variable instead of explicitly declaring a static. And if, as on the previous slide, it's a loop that normally iterates only once, your code will be in the hands of users before you even realize there's a problem. <clears throat> Let's take a brief detour to another of the surprising variety of async models found in this code base. We call this one Responder. A base class with a couple virtual methods, you derive a subclass, override the methods you care about, construct a heap instance, and pass a polymorphic pointer to the IO management code. Thoroughly proper Java style. So here we have some mainline code which wants to kick off an async request, actually a chain of async requests. It instantiates a responder subclass, initiates the async request, and returns to the main loop. The responder object receives a reply, instantiates another responder, and is destroyed, etc., etc., etc. The good thing about organizing the logic this way is that it eliminates the local variables problem we saw with the big switch statement. Any variable you can access that way is, it should be pertinent. 
The bad news, of course, is that you must explicitly pass along any state needed by the next responder subclass object or make it global. The other issue is that it becomes impossible to eyeball the flow of control. For starters, there's a big textual gap between the before code and the after code. Response processing is necessarily in a different method of a different class. It's the same reason that before C++11, standard for each didn't catch on like wildfire. Nobody's enthused about having to go look for the body of everything. <coughs> now let's consider the problem of introducing a new state. You have to create a new responder subclass, carve out part of the original response method, and pop it into the new subclass. You must explicitly pass along any data needed by the new response method, and by whatever responders might follow this one. In a heroic effort to actually reduce the size of the big switch statement I showed you previously, a former colleague extracted several cases and re-implemented them as a state machine using Blue's state chart. It would be foolish to try to show you all the logic on these slides. Even this little excerpt from one state's React method might be unreadable. I don't know from there. <clears throat> it's pages three through nine in the handout, or follow the link at the top. I purposely included most of his code to make a point. It's awfully tough to figure out what that code is doing. Which state transitions to what other state under what conditions? I have nothing against blue state chart or MSM. I know that there are problems for which a state machine is the best solution. This is not one of them. Your classic state machine addresses the kind of processing best described by a diagram. Consider the flowchart, a tool introduced in the 1960s to document computer processing. By the way, the middle box is the correct symbol for manual input. You can think of a flowchart as a state machine in which the trigger for each new state is simply the completion of the previous state's processing. But in the ensuing 50 years, hopefully we've made some advances both in language syntax and in our own ability to read code. I, for one, would much rather work with this small function definition than with the diagram on the previous slide. Some of you have undoubtedly been rolling your eyes this entire time thinking, why doesn't he just use Boost ASIO and be done with it? I will freely concede that in modern C++, we can do much better than Java. I love the way we can abstract the notion of a callable, free function, a functor, a bind expression, a lambda. <clears throat> we could take advantage of that, for example, to bind different methods of the same instance object as the different stages in our processing. That would solve the problem of where to put the shared data. That said, the code organization, the problem of following the logic flow, is not all that different from the responder pattern. I would still much rather work with this representation than to express the logic flow as chain sequence of async completion handlers. Which brings us to the punchline, the coroutine implementation of the same logic. The last three pages of the handout, or follow the link at the top, express the same control flow as the preceding seven pages. Why is that? Primarily, it's because with this model, we can express that logic without posting state transitions, defining internal entry points, or explicitly handing data from one state to another. Control flows from one C++ statement to the next using the ordinary rules of the language. We can declare, populate, and use local stack data regardless of intervening async I.O. because the coroutine has its own stack. And because we have the luxury of the stack, we can extract any logic we want into a helper function, even if that helper performs async I.O. What if we need to perform another async call somewhere in this routine? Easy. Just insert the call where you need it. 
What if we discover that one of the existing calls must be replaced with a non-blocking variant? Just replace the blocking function call with a function that engages the non-blocking machinery under the hood. Done. The code reads like ordinary C++ code making normal blocking calls. You don't even have to squint. On the handout, where I've got enough space for the whole login function, and in the online source, the essential control flow reveals itself to anyone who's taken an intro C++ course. It's a triply nested loop. That same control flow is encrypted in the state machine implementation, but I'm embarrassed to admit to you how long I spent studying the state machine code before I teased that out. You can think of coroutines as a way to organize code. You can write simple sequential logic with ordinary control structures. While you could theoretically use kernel threads instead, for us, that would be courting global disaster. With all the global accesses in our code, explicit context switching, the lack of true concurrency, far from being a drawback, is essential. That's what makes it viable to undertake a project to reorganize existing async code into a coroutine. That way you can put finite bounds around the coding effort and importantly, the QA. I have to apologize for uh, confusing terminology overload. The coroutine library uses the term future for an object that's used substantially differently than a standard thread. At least as I understand the thread future. Please correct me if I get this wrong. In both cases, there's a caller and an async function. With thread future, standard async instantiates a future object and returns it to the caller. At some point, the caller attempts to retrieve the value from that future object, which blocks if necessary until the value becomes available. In the coroutine case, the caller instantiates <coughs> a future object. From that, it makes a callback it passes the call back to the async function. At some point, the caller attempts to retrieve the value from the object, which blocks if necessary. When the async function calls the callback with its result, the callback passes the result back to the future object and unblocks it. I guess the reason he used the term future is that in both cases, the act of attempting to retrieve the value is what can block. The difference is in who instantiates the future object. So here's where we engage the Boost Coroutines API to perform async I.O. We declare a future object of a particular type, make a callback to that future, a callable that accepts an object of that type, arrange to call the callback when the async result arrives, and then attempt to dereference the future. This is what switches from the current stack back to the original stack, the main coroutine. This coroutine suspends right here until our async IO logic receives and parses the result and calls the specified callback. When it calls the callback, the callback we constructed from this particular future object, control switches back to the future, and we resume. So, okay, grubbing around with future objects is a bit fine grain. It's an implementation detail. Well, because we have our own stack, we don't have to clutter the coroutine's top logic with this detail. We've wrapped it in a helper function. The coroutine code on the handout calls this helper in a couple different places. In a classic <coughs> coroutine use case, like the Simon Tatham decompressor tokenizer example we looked at earlier, it's fairly typical for one participant to actually instantiate the other locally, then make calls into it until the whole task is done. The lifespan of this coroutine is neatly bounded by its invoker. In our case, though, the whole point of the coroutine is to manage fire and forget processing. Some mainline code needs to pick up a sequence of async I.O. requests, so it launches a coroutine. Having done that, it returns to the main loop. So who owns the coroutine instance? We implemented a singleton registry to launch and track coroutines by string name. This registry provides helper methods to facilitate launching a new coroutine 
retrieve the string name of the currently running coroutine, and clean up terminated coroutine instances. We did encounter one gotcha. I want to emphasize that this isn't unique to coroutines. You could, for instance, running the same problem with lambda capture, too. <coughs> when defining a function signature, I almost re reflexively accept parameters by const reference, except for, you know, in stump pointers and the like. So you're in the caller stack frame. You call the function, the, fun the, the compiler instantiates a temporary and calls my func with a reference to that temporary. The temporary persists until my func returns, compiler cleans up, and everybody's happy. So without thinking too hard about it, we apply the same reasoning to our coroutine signature, right? Back to the caller's stack frame. We go to launch the coroutine. The compiler instantiates a tempor temporary and calls bind with it. Bind copies it to a secret location. Launch invokes the coroutine, which calls the bind object, which calls my coroutine with a reference to the secret copy. The coroutine sets up, makes an async request, and blocks. Control returns to the original stack. The compiler cleans up temporaries, and the instantiating code returns to the main loop. Next time the coroutine wakes up and tries to access the reference parameter, boom! Solution. Don't pass reference parameters to a coroutine. Pass by value instead. I was fascinated on Monday when Lior showed a code example of a thread function accepting a const reference to a standard string. I asked him afterwards why that doesn't blow up. Stefan overheard the question, pulled out the iPad on which he lugs around the C++ standard, and showed me the work verbiage around making copies of thread parameters. I think it would be worth trying to make the coroutine library capture copies of coroutine function parameters the same way. It doesn't yet. Really, though, is any of this safe? I mean, it's all very well for Donald New, but can you really do this stuff in C++? Actually, people have been doing this stuff for at least a decade. The GNU PTH library, introduced in 1999, defines an API backed by an implementation in portable C. The POSIX standard specifies a uContext family of functions, make context, swap context, and the like. It's been deprecated, but for a pedantic reason. The make context function prototype specifies a type for the caller's past coroutine function pointer that's no longer valid in the C99 language standard. Nothing a little variadic template magic couldn't fix, though. And in Windows Server 2003, Microsoft formalized the concept as fibers, providing bundled library support for something people were already doing anyway. What's been missing is a modern, portable C++ API, just the sort of thing for which we turn to Boost. In 2006, as a Google Summer pilot project, Giovanni Duretta hosted a candidate Boost coroutine library using fibers on Windows, the uContext family on POSIX, and hand-coded assembler for speed. For use with our project, we made several tweaks to the library and have duly posted them to the vault. The tarball linked on the previous page does contain our changes. There was an oversight concerning the use of coroutine futures. Basically, we just had to reconcile futures with a more usual yield mechanism. We also added a hook to associate an opaque token with a given coroutine. This allows you to look up a string name for logging and such. At the time, it was important to us to support Mac OS X 10.4 Leopard, but OS X 10.4 did not yet support POSIX uContext. <coughs> we added a PTH implementation to the underlying context switching layer. But Giovanni's library is not our only way forward. Oliver Kowalki's Boost context library was reviewed and approved. It's now in the Boost trunk, though it hasn't yet made it to, to a Boost release. Context is a lower-level library, a foundation on which you would build a library such as Coroutine. 
Earlier I mentioned Coroutine's internal API layer to which we added PTH support. Context presents a standard API at that level. So one path would be to re-implement the Coroutine application level API on the lower level Boo's context library. In fact, Oliver has quite recently done just that. In the Gatorius repository cited here, he presents a Boost package containing an implementation of Coroutine based on context. He was very much hoping I would be able to speak at this conference about integrating his work into our product. Sorry, ran out of time. I do intend to do that, I just haven't yet. Oliver also tossed me a tantalizing hint about his work on another concurrency API built on co context, Boost Stratified, inspired by Stratified JavaScript. He suggests, and it sounds promising, that Boost Stratified would actually support our use case better than Coroutine Futures. We will see. some questions. <laughs> Anybody curious about performance? Yes. yes. Okay. So remember that all of this is user space. It is inherently cheaper than an OS context switch. I'm talking about time slicing threads. You are doing this by changing a stack pointer. Much of the user space context switching technology has been driven by applications that need better performance than you can get with thread switching. For us, though, Coroutine's managed uh, async network I.O. The network round trip completely dwarfs um, the cost of working on this one. You're wondering about exceptions. Oh, here you go. Sure. Yeah, sure. Well, we run unit tests with every build that exercise exception processing within a coroutine. Uh, the present boost context implementation doesn't propagate exceptions out of a coroutine, but we could, for instance, use boost exception to transport exceptions back to the main coroutine if we wanted that. You were going to ask, there you go. I was going to say, well, C11 gives exception pointer, which makes it much easier to transfer exceptions between the two stacks as well. Right. In effect, um, we could use that or boost exception. Um, but either one would give us that. So, so in effect, what you want is to transport the, the exception from the code to the future and then go to the future and call it the exception. I probably wouldn't need to do that. I probably would. Um, in effect, wrap the entire coroutine uh, function that was passed into the library with another function that would have the try catch and would then make sure to transport the exception back to the main coroutine. Identifying the main coroutine is the interesting problem, but for our case, it's simply the coroutine which initiates the, the new coroutine. Does that lose the context of the place that the exception? Interesting you should ask, because I think this is what the chained exceptions are all about. Yes? So the main coroutine does play nicely, though, with other like rendering loops or you are IO loops or things like that. The main coroutine is still doing our main loop. It handles the input events, it does the rendering, all of that is still going on. And as I said earlier, this coroutine stuff is just a way of organizing code that was just being executed in responder objects. It just reads better and is more maintainable and I won't restate all of that. Yeah. Anybody curious about the bug? Oh. Okay. <clears throat> so in the tokenizer, if you get an EOF in the middle of a word token, you fall out, it becomes a punched token of its own. Easy to handle. Um, but my point is that you can look at this code and observe that. You don't have to hit it in the wild. That's the kind of simplicity that I want from our code. 
I guess we're done. Thank you very much.